On this episode of What's New TV, we'll speak with international fine artist Jonathan Belecki. We'll hear a little bit about his escape from Soviet Hungary, what it's like being a professional artist in the business of selling paintings, and what he thinks of the current industry and bananas taped to walls. I'm Jeremy Ladner, and this is What's New. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for being on the show. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. So what some people might not know is uh, Jonathan and I are friends. We've been friends now for a few years. I've had the opportunity to work with Jonathan, to travel with Jonathan. I've had the opportunity to eat some of his hamburgers, which are delicious. And you know that I like hamburgers if you've watched this channel before. Um, Jonathan has been kind enough to share his story with me, and I thought that it might be interesting and some of you might enjoy it as well. We cover a lot of different types of businesses on the show, from large international enterprises to small, local, owner-operator type businesses. And the the business of art is, I've always thought, is is fascinating, and and I've had the opportunity to talk to Jonathan about this before. Being a great artist, being a great technical artist, is certainly a gift and something that people work years at, Uh, but the, the, the great tool when it comes to selling your art often is being able to tell a story about it, being able to sort of create a mystique around the artist. And is the example that we, that probably the biggest thing in the news right now is in the past, uh, I guess it was probably about a month ago, it went international. There was a story in the, uh, in the New York Times, I'll see if I can bring that up, where, uh, where there was a, a piece of art that was sold for $120,000. And if, if you guys aren't aware of this, here it is on screen. New York Times reporting on it, $120,000, a banana, maybe not even the best banana, taped with duct tape to a wall. And we'll get to Jonathan's opinion of this in a, in a second. But really here, I think the, the, the masterful art is not in the creation of the art itself, but in the folks who are able to convince people that this is actually art and, and have someone pay for it. This isn't just the price tag. Someone agreed to pay $120,000 for this banana tape to the wall. Now, Jonathan, to your story, uh, which is uh, is fascinating for sure. Born in Soviet Hungary, uh, what was that like? Well, in that time, I couldn't compare it to anything else because that's all I knew. And it was very restrictive. It was uh, not encouraging any individualism, we didn't have a choice uh, between uh, opposing things. The uh, the current or then uh, ruling party line and the ruling party's vision uh, has to be supported. And if you're not supporting it, then you weren't a good guy. If you were opposing it, then you looked for a uh, not a good day for yourself you could end up in Siberia you can end up dead or tortured so it was very restrictive people were afraid people were afraid to say what is in their mind if it's not aligned with the with the, uh, the then the only party line what uh, what is so interesting and, and of course this is art is always not always, but art is often tied to politics. It's often social commentary, and, and politics are, are a key component of that. What What is in the news today is, is in the U.S., at least, the Democrat Party and in, in, in parts of uh, Western Europe. There seems to be this shift towards a newfound love affair with, with socialism. And, and as most of us know who've studied a little bit of history, so, socialism, socialism almost inevitably ends up leading towards communism and totalitarian dictatorships and uh, the idea of equality and everything being free for everyone sounds like a wonderful story at the beginning but what people don't often understand is when they're buying that part of socialism and communism what comes with that is the complete absence of freedom Uh, that's what you're willing to surrender that's the price tag for everybody gets the same but they, but they don't tell you that everybody gets the same amount of misery uh, and the ma- same amount of suffering and the same amount of absence of, of freedom. Um, that's my social commentary, my, my politics bleeding into this. Uh, I, I have to imagine that creating art in an environment 
or even being introduced to art in an environment like that gives you a certain type of freedom because you can create images where you're expressing your individual opinion, which might be contrary to the powers that be, but you can do it in a creative way that isn't necessarily so um, obvious. And so you can often offer your commentary in that sense. And as is often the case, artists usually tend to be anti-establishment and don't like the idea of having their freedoms limited and, and their ability to speak limited. So when you, when you find yourself surrounded by people like that, as, as we've spoken about, and you've told me a little bit, and you can share with us the idea that the, in the community that you were in, you had some friends whose parents were artists and helped expose you to that world. What was that like? Well, back to the beginning of the uh, what, what you mentioned about Hungary then, because it's hard to um, imagine uh, for people uh, today, is that we had a good joke about it, that the, the misconception about uh, communism, or socialism, that we are all equal. And, uh, and the joke was, and of course you could be arrested for that joke, that in socialism everyone everyone are equal, but there are people who are more equal. Right. So it's really like a ruling party, they, they're ruling elite. They, they had everything and the rest of the country, like 99% were in poverty, same as in Venezuela today. But yes, art was not only opposing the ruling part in the misery, but art was also to escaping it. So it's not necessarily every art is going to stand up and end up in jail and, and paint or create something anti-establishment, but the very fact that they can do something, uh, even if you paint a flower, if you do something that has nothing to do with politics, you escape the world where, where there is peace. You escape the world where there is there is the absence of, of misery. That's already a good start. Right. That's um, that ability to escape misery or the absence of freedom into a world where you're free to create whatever it is that you want to create is, uh, right. is definitely a gift and, and a power that's whether it's through painting or through writing that so many people have uh, employed when they are in a situation where there is profound suffering. Um, okay, so let's let's move forward a little bit. Let's talk about after you left Hungary, after you managed to get out of there, uh, and you ended up in Toronto, Canada. Is that correct? Yes, we ended up in Canada first a few years. I was born in Hamilton and later in Toronto. Okay. So as any new immigrant, I was they were preoccupied to make a living, and art was not uh, on the table for, for a long time. And uh, it came much, much later uh, when my late wife passed, life changed. I uh, started to paint, and the, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, meet a very supportive uh a lot of my life and the last nine years uh, because she's encouraging me and I always had it in me, I do paint a lot. That's great. So I know back in, sorry to interrupt you, so back in, in Toronto, I want to hear about that, that first show, the first opportunity you had after putting together a body of work, after creating these pieces of, of art, having it on a wall, being able to share it with other people. Because I, as an artist myself, I've done some oil and uh, portrait work myself. I, the, 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 the challenge is you create the art in a vacuum. You're by yourself in your studio, you, the canvas, the art, and then suddenly there it is in the world. You're sharing it with, with family and friends and, and strangers and, of course, also looking for uh, approval and affirmation from an art community that you're hoping will help you then sell the art. I mean, that's the goal of every artist, or at least most artists, I'd say, is you're creating something that you love but you also want someone else who loves it and appreciates it enough to say, here's some money. May I take that home with me and hang it on my wall, please? Or at least even uh, people who own galleries who believe in you enough to, to support you and to help uh, get the word out and, and show the community that they believe in you. And, and, and the end goal is 
something where you'd like to share it with the world and, and hopefully have them believe in it enough and love it enough that, uh, that they're willing to exchange funds so that they can hold it and, and take it home with them. What was that first showing? You, you, I think we've spoken about this before. Was it Yorkville that you mentioned, Yorkville in Toronto, where you had your first gallery showing? Yes, uh, it was very significant. Uh, you're right to point it out. It was, I still remember as, as it burned into my memory, it was very surrealistic to believe that after 35 years not painting and I just started to paint, a, a reputable gallery gives me the option for a solo exhibition. I never would have done it alone. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Dana had uh, uh, the courage to walk into a gallery and introduce my art, and they took me, so that was awesome. And yes, I was very nervous because uh, the art critic came out. I didn't know what the, what the outcome going to be, what the result. Art Toronto wrote very favorable about that show, and, and I was very, very happy, very satisfied that uh, people started to get to know my art. I don't know if it's narcissist uh, attitude of mine or or really I want to share it, but uh, it was significant. I liked it. And the second show, I liked every show what we had. I liked it. And I think each of them were very significant from uh, the point of view that I, I shared. People were able to buy it and and, and view it and talk about it. It's 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 it's, it's very satisfactory for me. I, I I've had a few experiences similar to that, and there's nothing like when you've created something in the vacuum of of your own studio to be able to show it to the world and have people not who who are not your friends and family. There's no obligation there for them to say, "Wow, that's amazing, very good, well job." These are complete strangers who could just simply turn their back and turn away and, and not say anything, but for them to come up to you and say, "Wow, that is amazing. That is beautiful. That has touched me. It's inspired me so much so that I have to own it." Uh, that is it's an amazing feeling and and I'm fortunate enough to have experienced that a couple times and I know that you've experienced it many times and have your I've had showings around the world and have sold art around the world to different collectors and and congratulations to you. That's 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 fantastic. Um, moving on, I know that you're working on a series right now, which I've seen and I think let me check here for a second. But if I'm not mistaken, is there a piece hanging behind you? Oh, there is the, there is a piece that I like. I know that. Over your right-hand shoulder, the woman with the umbrella walking in the rain. That's part of a similar series that you're working on right now, which is... Well, what's the title of it, if you can remind me? The, the latest was uh, the Riding in the Rain, but it was very similar. or It is, could be part of the, the series where rain drops and, and water destructs reality in certain ways in... in, in and it's different, different visual Beautiful effects. stuff. It's just gorgeous. I, I love those pieces. There's something um, magical and serene and Thanks. contemplative about those. My favorite artist of all time, Edward Hopper, uh, has a piece called The Automat, which I love. Oh. And uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at that and, and trying in my own pieces to, to emulate. And there's a quality about the series that you're working on with the raindrops, it has a very similar kind of vibe to it that I really, really like. It's quiet, contemplative, um, mournful, um, and beautiful all at the same time. Um, I'm going to show a piece right now, if I can. There we go. Um, which is one of the one of your latest pieces, if I'm not mistaken. The drawing on the canvas, correct. Right. Uh, I love this piece, and, and I know that one of the challenges uh, as, as an artist is, is selling your work. Obviously, you want to be able to make a living for it, from it. Some artists have more of a challenge than others. You've been very fortunate that you've sold many, many pieces. Um, and, you've had, and, and one of the great things about being in this sort of social media reality is that we have a lot more connection with our audience, in your case, the people who purchase and follow and, and love your artwork. And there's been some requests uh, for you to do some smaller pieces. There are a lot of people living in small apartments or condominiums who don't necessarily have massive high ceilings to hang their art. And so in response to that, you've done a few pieces 
that are a little bit on the smaller side. I think this piece is 40 by 60 centimeters. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. And one of the benefits of doing smaller pieces oftentimes is that they can also be more affordable. So for people who are just starting out in their appreciation of art and are looking to have something beyond a print that they might buy from Ikea, but an actual piece of real art and, su and support artists, uh, a piece like this, I think we've spoken about it, but you were saying it's somewhere around the $2,000 range. Is that correct? That is correct. That's an amazing deal. I might have to talk to you about this after the show. Uh, I would not mind at all having this hanging in my home. Jonathan, thank you so much for, uh, for being a part of the show. I really, really appreciate it. Is there anything uh, that you'd like to say uh, before you go? Where is, is, is there a, sh a gallery showing coming up? Have you got something planned in, uh, in Canada this summer, perhaps? Or we're still going to wait to hear about that? You wanna, we'll save that surprise for, for next time, maybe? We're going to have a surprise by this spring. Okay, great. So if anybody would like to get in touch with uh, Jonathan, they certainly can do so at uh, jonathanbalecki.com. You can find him on Instagram. You can find him on Facebook as well at Jonathan Balecki. Uh, the spelling is on the screen. Again, Jonathan, thank you so much for being on the show. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Until next time, thanks to all of you for watching the show. If you liked it, let us know. Like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell to make sure you find out about all of the latest shows from What's New.TV. Until next time, I'm Jeremy Ladner, and this is What's New.